G'day and welcome to another episode of Perth Property Insider. I'm your host, Jared Mann, and today I'm really excited to have Jay Sidhu, one of my good friends. He's the director at Vision Surveys Consulting. They're a surveyor and project management company that manages a lot of subdivisions across Perth. They're my go-to for the residential subdivisions and helping our clients, I guess, prevent them making the costly mistakes and to have an ultimately profitable project. So in this episode, we've had to break things up into two parts. We got so carried away that I've had to split the episode in two for you. And in this one, I'm going to be going into Jay's some of Jay's background on investing. How does a subdivision potentially fit into your overall strategy as an investor? What would he do if he was starting again? And some of the mistakes that we see investors making day in and day out. Uh, between us, we've seen a lot of mistakes come up and we really want to help prevent you from making those. And finally, in this first part, I'm going into what he's seeing happening in the Perth market and what his clients are doing and what is his outlook for the Perth market ahead. So let's go inside. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management specialist servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here is your host, Jared Mann. G'day, Jay. Thanks for joining us, Perth Property Insider. Really excited to have you along today. Hey, Jared. Always a, always a pleasure to talk to yourself and the team, mate. Great team you have there. Yeah, well, usually we're out having lunch together, but that doesn't lend as well for a podcast. So noise in the background of the uh, restaurant. So I really wanted people to come inside your world and your experiences so far as both an investor and, you know, the director of one of the most successful surveying companies in Perth. And it's not just surveying that you do, of course, you manage projects and uh, you yep. know, handle all kinds of things. But before we get into that, I just wanted to um, start at the beginning, I guess, of your investing journey and give us a little bit of background as to what you've done in that so far. Well, you know, being in being in this field, right? If you don't, if you're not actually investing in property yourself, um, sooner or later, it's going to hit you that you're going, oh man, I'm working with my client in this project and it's turned out so great. And then you get that <laughs> feel of it. And then you keep doing it again and again and again. You're going, I really have that itch. I need to do something because, you know, if you put yourself in my shoe and we're doing all these projects with the clients and trying to get all the best possible time frame and doing it at the best possible cost, obtaining the best possible profits, yeah. you are going to feel left out if you don't. And that's basically my story and my beginning as to how I started investing into, uh, into subdivisions and property land development. Yeah. yeah. Well, you obviously see when there's the scheme changes and see, you know, well ahead of time when areas are going to start have the coding necessary to subdivide. And I know you've gotten on the ground floor of a lot of areas ahead of time and it, it really is where a lot of money is to be made. Yeah, well, look, it, you're right. You're right in saying that. Um, but there's always, you've got to always err inside of caution because until it's actually in place, anything can happen. Yeah. And I think we've discussed this in the past where, you know, we're, we're talking about a project and I go, well, you know, but it's not, let's say if we were doing a conditional proof, it's like it's not conditionally approved yet, but we have to weigh that risk ourselves, right? So yes, yeah. um, you're right. Looking through like, you know, with the canning precinct and stuff like that, that we were talking, a lot of opportunities there that were to be made and yeah, the punt had to be taken and just... And obviously, yeah, City of Joondalup's already looking entirely different to where it looked you know the landscape three four exactly. years ago so exactly. now there's almost a subdivision on every street corner <laughs> so things have changed a lot there that's right that's right and then uh, with city of june club you see like if we didn't strike well the iron was hot before now you've got all these issues yeah. where 
they're trying to bring in even more changes to try and restrict it. And you're just saying with some of the changes to the setbacks, that landscape is going to look a bit different now, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, if if it was now and I was uh, investing in June Club at the moment, it would be a bit different. My you know, feeling towards it would be different to when you and I were working on that project in June Club uh, a few years ago because we struck an iron spot when the changes were you know, new and just go in and get it yeah. done. But now, you know, with all the uncertainty out there, yeah. Well, with that type of, uh, you know, higher density. Is is property, you know, with, with property development, you know, the more in, information you have and the good team around you, like, you know, I, I don't just say this to, to my clients. I actually, you know, practice what I preach here because, you know, even when I'm doing something, I, I am speaking to the professionals I know as well. Yeah. And yes, obviously I know the subdivision side of things, the costs involved and whatnot, but I start to speak to people like you going, Jared, if I created this, any uh, potential takers here? What's mate? it going to rent for as well? You know? <laughs> <laughs> if you did end up building on it, but you, your formula is more from the outside being just like, because you're so intimate with the land, you and I guess if you ever joint venture with someone, you're selling a lot of that in most cases and not going through to building. Is that kind of been what's worked for you so far? Yes. At the particular, you know, my current formula is basically in and out. Uh, yep. Like, like burger, you know, just in and out. Come in, do the stuff, get the subdivision rolling, finish the subdivision as fast as possible and, and out I go and into the next one. And sometimes I'll have multiples being done at the same time yeah. but that all depends on on cash flow at that particular moment in time and you know and how do you just, find just, you know in uh, last week's episode i i've gone really deep into strategy and and looked at some of the the negatives of always selling properties and there's a lot of investors out there that put a lot of effort into developing but don't really hold anything to compound and you also do pay a lot of tax in when you sell. So there's certainly some negatives, but it does help you chunk up your capital to get to the place where you can hold some more quality assets, I guess, through an upswing. So is that going to change exactly. for you moving forward or how do you see that chunking of capital working in the overall picture? Well, for me at the moment, because, you know, I'm not, I can't say that I'm seasoned. So I'm, I'm more at the start of my journey and like I said, you know, I, I really did help a lot of my clients at the start to do a lot of this. So the itch was there to start doing yeah. it. And I had to find whatever means necessary to get in there. Otherwise, I get crazy. But now this whole formula that I have is, is for the moment, for this particular moment in time. And it's just to, like you say, get to a part, part in time where I can actually go, yep, great. I'm going to start buying this, this, this and keep it maybe you know, do a, a, my portfolio will be completely different to what it is now. It's currently, it's just a, a stepping stone to bigger and better things. And it's really good when you've got the awareness of where that fits in that overall journey and towards the destination, I guess, of one day having more passive income than we do work income and replacing our income, but it doesn't happen overnight, of course. Yes, of course not. Yeah. Compound your experience and then you can start <laughs> compounding your returns. So I guess if you were starting again as a property investor, and I get the question a lot, and we're certainly starting to get it almost on a daily basis again now that property is becoming the flavor of the month and the barbecue conversation again. So what would you say to that starting out investor as, you know, what should they think about and, and what's a good place for them to start? Would you suggest subdivision to them or... Do you think that people should well, gain some more experience first? I know I'm putting you on the spot and asking you hard questions here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, subdivision is just a particular way of, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the avenues to generate okay. some wealth. But uh, I've got, I mean, for yourself, for instance, some other clients of mine who started off very differently, which is a property, rent it out, get through to that landlord phase and all that. And my my advice wouldn't be to someone to just go, yep, go subdivide, go subdivide, yeah. go subdivide. That's many different paths, it's, isn't it's there? It's so and many different paths. Yeah. You would have seen the sprookers over the years 
too. Uh, you've been in it long enough. And anyone that says to everyone that you should buy in this specific area or that you should use this one strategy that benefits them, you know, yeah. you have yeah. to start smelling BS on that, don't you? Mate, yeah, I, uh, I completely shut off when someone, uh, when, when someone does that. And I assume that someone would do that too, hopefully, but not all the time because you do see... Yeah. Some people who can't uh, see that. But the only reason why I started off my property journey with subdivisions is, like I said, I mean, the game. your experience was as well. And you'd yeah, always it's, be you yeah. know, negligent not to capitalize on what you know. Exactly. That's the only reason. It's not the winning formula or anything like that. It's just that I feel like I'm comfortable in it. Yeah. I'm, it's risky, but I'm always... Well, you're a lot more aware of the particular yeah. risks and you minimize them. Whereas yeah. perhaps you going and doing a renovation when you've never done one, that could be a lot more riskier. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the context that, uh, that, uh, that I have in the industry or with, you know, with professionals out there when I'm doing something, um, it just, it just makes me a lot. I feel better knowing that I will be able to solve any issues that come up. And yeah. mate, every subdivision that I've done, <laughs> there's always an issue. It's all about a game of solving issues with subdivisions, yeah. no matter how easy it is. Yeah. And what are some of those issues that you've seen come up? Or I guess there's always going to be issues, isn't there, as you just said. But what are the, some of the mistakes that investors might have made in handling them or in managing their overall project? What's the, what's the common ones that you... Well, it's not about, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be about managing the projects. It's about underestimating the complexity of the subdivision before it is even conditionally approved. Sometimes people will go and have a particular amount of, you know, stuff in the piggy bank, they're ready for the subdivision, but they don't account for public open space contribution. You know? Oh, yeah, you know, I've heard that this will be fine, you know? Do you, are you sure that it's going to be fine? Have yeah. you got a conditional approval that says that you don't need it? Is that going to be a problem? Do we have to argue this at planning commission? I think one of the common ones I see is people don't appreciate how important soil type is. Oh, man. Look, that's so, a south of the river problem, you know? Yeah. Crazy. Every single person I deal with there will go, and not every single, 90% of them, Jay, I've just bought a block. I think I paid amazing for it. Like, you know, it's great value. Got it cheap. Can I do a subdivision? <laughs> How much is it going to be? And then when my figures come up and I go, look, usually over here is X amount, but just because you're here. Every time a client in South River calls me up and says, look, I've just, you know, got this bargain of a block and tell me how much a subdivision is going to cost. It's always going to be a lot more than, than a standard block that doesn't have you know, clay in it. It's yeah. just it's clay grading, getting rid of the clay, bringing in clean field sand. That's going to cost you money. These are all costs that are, you know, we, you and I, we know that. We look at a block like that. We go, yep, it's going to be extra costs involved here. But yeah. people just go, well, it's just a, it's the same dimension as my friend's block. Like I've got a block in Maddington and my friend has a block in Scarborough. Why is it the exact same dimension block is going to be X amount different. Oh, Jay's probably not telling the right thing yeah. here. Go and get another surveyor yeah. that doesn't tell them what they need to know up front and they get into things later and and realize that everything's a lot more expensive all the way along. So yeah, but it's not it's not that the surveyors don't tell them, it's just that the question asked, like um, the yeah. question asked of me is how much is this subdivision going to cost? Usually what they want is just my quote, but I never just say what well, my quote i'm going have you thought of everything yeah because i don't even want to give you a quote if you don't know what is going to be entailed for this and that's where you've <laughs> always been different everyone else yeah. either they a lot of other surveyors either don't have that wider perspective of doing the entire development and when and things to look out for or they just stick in their pure lane and only you know just sell their service and you know rightly or wrongly 
But look, the, at the end of the day, it's what they asked for. You know, they've asked yeah. for giving this. You know, do I need to go that extra mile to tell you all this stuff? No, not really. But I just don't want to see someone start. It's a lot of money to start off with, and that money can be used for something else. We're not talking about a couple of grand. I mean, just one to thousand dollars. This is you know to get you to up to a conditional approval will cost you about six. Just for a standard block, you know, with all the WPC fees, was all the other yeah. fees involved from professionally in the start, and then you find out you have a problem. That's yeah, quite a bit of money. It could have been spent. And I guess elsewhere. I've always suggested people consider putting subject to a geotechnical report, being satisfied with it in the offer conditions, mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. you know they can go and get the specific soil tested. But I guess yeah. you'd know when you're in those areas that more more often than not it is going to be bad soil clay soil and the costs are going to be higher and so yeah if you factor that in from the start and then it ends up being better uh you're pretty happy with the extra that you've saved (laughs) more often Um, than not you're having to pay the extra sometimes i get a question of okay well you know that the soil is going to be bad here so tell me how much it's going to be I go, well, not, it's not bad, it's, it's clay, but it's not about there being clay or not. Yes, I think there's going to be clay there, but it's about how much to remove and how much to bring back. Yeah, what depth. That's why. How much extra clean fill you need to bring back, yeah. Yeah, so that's the cost. It's not just about, it's, it, there's no, I can't give you a formula that going, is going to apply to every single block. It's yeah. just... It's just not there, yeah. And yeah. where do uh, the other thing I see readily is not factoring in the slope of blocks and retaining. Is that a big one? <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, this is the best part. Um, uh, look, when we're doing a surveying, uh, sorry, when we're looking at a block and, and the client goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slight slope, slight slope, <laughs> and uh, and they're looking and they're looking. Classic at real estate a, agent a, ad. Slight <laughs> slope, <laughs> relatively at, flat. No, it's like pure. It's a vanilla site. Um, <laughs> but at the straight, end of the day, I'll use uh, other words there too, like straightforward. Should be should be straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you actually go and do the survey because I you can tell me whatever you want, but until I see those numbers on a on a survey plan with a, with a little X and a, and a contour line next to it with, with the spot height, then I will believe it. But once you see all that, and then that goes to an architect or a, or a building designer, and they go, oh man, like, you know, we got to step this block. Like, you know, the first house is going to be here, second house is going to be here, third house is going to be here. This is, this is no easy site. Uh, it's going to come up with a lot of retaining. Um, and and more often than not, look the the projects that I usually do with fully from the start land all the way up to build. So yeah. we do need to take that into consideration. I have to think about all this straight in the start. I want to be able to to tell my clients that hey, have you thought of this because this is an extra cost. Very important stuff. Yeah, and retaining okay. walls, big thing. Especially with between your neighbors as well. So yeah. your block and your neighboring block. So yeah, that the one that I just spoke to you about, that example, that's within that's our just, block itself. Yeah. But if we're developing our block and there's a big significant difference between our block and our neighboring blocks, we're supposed to be doing those retaining walls. And that's mm-hmm. all cost. And boundary fencing too is often left out. I know it's not, you know, a huge cost per linear meter, might be a hundred odd dollars, but if you have to go and replace all three boundary fences and they're in okay condition, you know, it can be very hard to get the neighbors to agree to put up half, especially if it kind of passes the current standard. So, yeah, look, I um, I want to say, I've dealt with so many boundary fencing issues now (laughs) that that it's kind of like a, in my head, I've got a template on how to talk to people, but at the end of the day, my advice is that is to be genuine. Yep. You know, don't don't try and hide anything. You're not trying to hide anything. You're just doing a development that more often than not needs an asbestos fence removed and something to be changed. Now, there's a dividing fencing act, fences act that you should follow, and you know you can, for document purposes do all the documents that you need. But 
face-to-face conversation is important. And another note to note there is fencing is not a subdivision issue. It never is. But with aesthetics, you do a subdivision that looks great and you've got yeah. fencing that, that is crap. Good luck, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> it does make the sale a lot harder, doesn't it? Yeah. And I yeah. guess when the market's rampant and, you know, you can put a photo or just an aerial photo online without even going out to the site, you know, and you can sell anything. When, when blocks are walking out the door, as they were with the building grants, yeah. buyers are not Perfect. as worried about boundary fencing and they're often discovering later that there are all these extra costs. Yeah. But, you know, especially in some of the markets you've sold through over the last three to five years, these things make a big difference and it will help you get a premium and help a buyer get in that emotional space when looking at something won't it oh most definitely yeah i think i believe that uh, one of my first few was that, that you helped me with was in of a market lull and it was quite stressful mm-hmm. sitting there uh trying to get a deal and it was it was quite difficult but i could just imagine if i didn't change those fencing to better fencing and you have that extra layer to tackle <laughs> Definitely. oh man sometimes i feel like going out and replacing the fencing myself <laughs> <laughs> The owner won't agree. We're doing yeah. it anyway. <laughs> We're doing it anyway. Oh dear. That's definitely definitely something to think about. And speaking about fencing and dividing boundaries, another thing to always think about, you know, bores. Now, bores are often near boundaries, usually near dividing boundaries. Well, the last five that I've dealt with have been really close to dividing boundaries. Now, what happens is bores can be quite deep, right? And capping them properly, filling them up, and yes, yeah. is is very very important. And is an un, you know, you just it's an unforeseen circumstance. Plus the pricing, you just don't know until you need yeah. to know what you need to do. So if you, if I can advise people here, which is a little bit different, and maybe people don't think about this, is have a look in more detail if you've got bore on your site and what you need to do to get rid of it because it's it's never included in the demolition. Yeah. Everyone would just go, oh. Uh, yeah, oh, we've discovered this later. <laughs> that's a pretty deep one. It's, well, it's not discovered later. This is the other thing, right? That's always been there. But the fine prints will always be. Well, it'll be on the contour survey, won't it? In most likelihood, if it's Yeah, been, it'll be uh, on the contour survey. But the contract for the demo or any earthwork will be, yep. Yeah, everyone kind of leaves it out of there. Yeah, so just what check. Doing. Just check. That's it. Yeah, that could easily. I think I did one in uh, Westminster recently. That yeah, it was definitely about 3K. Yeah. It was deep. It was, I want to say, 11.5 meters. I guess all these things add up, don't they? Sometimes it's like, uh, can be death by a thousand cuts. <laughs> so it is oh, yeah. good to get a handle on as many of them from the outset, preferably before you make your offer, not after. <laughs> so do you get yeah, that as well a it. lot? Jared, uh, Jay, I've just bought this property. What do you think? <laughs> Like every day, like, <laughs> like, you know, this is what I'm going to go. So wait, did you just say you bought the yeah, property? You're asking of. me that you want to buy the property. No, no, no. I bought it. It's uh, it's done. Let's go get it done. I'm like, oh, did you think of this, 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 this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. I sometimes feel. So that I. It's a tough position that it puts us in, isn't it? Because if the person really cared about what we thought, that well, they should think to ask us before they buy and of mm-hmm. course it's difficult when we're very busy we've got to be sure that the person's serious enough that they are you know at final stages of, of diligence and I know you help a lot of people out at that mm-hmm. stage of things and having a bit of a due diligence yeah. assessment kind of service which yeah. is something that people yeah. should definitely know about yeah. But it's uh yeah definitely needs to be before doesn't it because afterwards I feel like how much do I tell this person I'm going to tell them everything but it's going to break their heart and you can just hear their disappointment and heart breaking as you're you know dropping the news to them can't you it's horrible yeah well that actually happens quite often but not with regular clients regular clients of mine um, all know to to call but the ones that aren't so regular and then they call up and I tell them what it is as it is those are the guys that I tend to not sign up because well, not I don't sign up, but I just don't get signed up because maybe they just heard something they didn't like. Yeah, Jay gave <laughs> me lots of problems, but it's 
you can solve them, but they've got to be factored yeah. in, don't they? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what uh, activity are you seeing in the Perth market at the moment from your view? And uh, what are your clients up to? Everyone's just pushing the button. Yeah, pushing the button, getting everything Last going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just pretty much go, and go, go. People that have existing sites that they're now deciding to do something with uh, there's a bit more confidence or is a it mix, mix of both, yeah. a mix of both is what I'm seeing and I can only tell based on the work that I'm currently doing yeah. for clients um, I know that you know I read all the updates all the time sometimes I agree fully sometimes I don't but what I'm also seeing is a lot of apartments starting again okay. and um, all these projects that uh, just gearing up and going because yeah, you obviously you know, handle so. the higher density yeah yeah survey side as well don't you yep exactly i know that uh feel of apartments aren't really that much there but what i'm seeing is people are are trying to sell them more yeah. at the moment i guess if yeah. we are going to get a lot of foreign foreigners coming over they're a lot more used to apartment living mm-hmm. and there is a real big push in the city of Perth itself to bring vibrancy back with the universities, you know, all getting their place in the town, in the CBD. And, you know, we may actually have a real chance of moving towards some vibrancy and some greater adoption of apartments, but it's certainly a a lot riskier type of property for me and not in my comfort zone. (laughs) So... Oh, most definitely. Look, I, I tend to consult a lot on, on built form products and apartment products and the likes, and I really do enjoy it. Of course, but, if yeah. it's in the right area and some people have done some really nice premium high-end yeah. units that there's a real gap in the market for, I've seen. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Location can still win out, but I guess for the average investor, it's you know probably well above where they should be looking. <laughs> No, of course, yeah. And for myself, like, you know, I don't see myself buying an apartment, only land. But then again, I'm, like, I'm biased and land's <laughs> there, so. <laughs> land's what <you> want, yeah. <laughs> so what outlook do you see for the Perth market ahead? I know. Uh... I think um, I, look, we, I think the results are out that we're the only state that had a growth in this whole pandemic um so i have a positive outlook on wa i am also biased because i'm a wa boy but mm-hmm. with everything with property it can go up it'll have to come down a little bit and then it might go up again but i feel like we're in a in a comfortable comfortable spot hopefully so yeah, yeah definitely. even throughout even throughout covid as well i tried to make sure that um and and as a company we kept, you know, we kept in contact with our clients. We yeah, just get back to basics on everything, isn't it? Get back to basics. You know, we 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 double down on your service. We got people to put in applications when they didn't think that they wanted to, and we thought, look, you know, now's the time to do it. It's quiet, and we have so many clients who are so thankful that they did spend that money during COVID because, as you know, during June after. Uh, Mark McGowan um, announced everything. Every my phone was literally off the hook. Basically, people going, "Oh my gosh, thank you so much for asking me to put that application in three months ago when everyone else was not doing anything." Because literally, you are starting from the moment the announcement was done. You're really starting to finalize the subdivision and not start the process. Yeah. And was yeah. it even possible for someone that hadn't done anything? to progress a project in time to capitalize on the grants or was it just not possible? It wasn't the start. And then until after that, it started getting very pushy, but then people, people always find a way, you know, I don't give advice on, on that and grant part because that's not my forte. And you know me, like I try to make sure that, you know, even if I didn't know it would be something that, you know, I'm educating myself on, but I don't preach it if, if I don't know about it fully to clients but what i saw is that you know there's always ways to for them to try and make sure that they get it and it's all about time frame i guess a lot of the unknowns were how long councils were going to take how long all the other service providers required are going to take too and 
that's where yeah. you know it became very yeah. difficult. And a lot of them did streamline it a lot well, like Water Corporation and Western Power really did do a good job um, updating their systems online, trying to make sure everything is streamlined. Look, as for local governments, they're all just very different, stuck in their own ways, and I don't, I don't really see anything that has changed in their processes that allow for something to be processed quicker. You know? <laughs> no. yeah, look, it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's disappointing. It's disappointing, but it was crazy I, to go from almost skeleton, you know, skeleton crews everywhere in every type of industry and everyone, you know, very productive probably with where they were down to, to then overnight having to suddenly deliver on, you know, massive volumes of work. So yeah, it's understandable, yeah. isn't it? That something has to give. Definitely. So thanks for joining me today, Jay. We've got so much more to cover. I'm going to have to get you to come back and we'll do another episode of part two where we can chat about some of the steps to subdivide a corner block or a duplex property when we retain the house. And we can also go into some of the costs, the time to allow, as well as how to work out if the property stacks up and some of the other mistakes you see investors make. So looking forward to chatting with you on the next one. And in the meantime, if you like our show, make sure you click the subscribe button.